kind of awesome to speak for John because he really gave me a chance when I hadn't spoken anywhere and he had no idea if I would turn out to, you know, stand up on the stage and go, uh, 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 or if I would actually be able to speak and, and took a bigger chance in letting me talk about something which was kind of off the original agenda. Um, so very grateful about that and, and um, kind of life-changing moment there. Um, but I was not a Java programmer when I met him. I was a carpenter, so small adjustment. <laughs> um, so today, yes, I'm going to change up my topic a little bit again because as often happens, I'm generally speaking super excited about something that's going on right now and you have to propose talk, uh, topics much in advance and it doesn't always correlate. So this is going to end up being kind of a mishmash of some SaaS stuff and some style guide stuff and some process stuff. Um, at some point, I didn't actually think that process was very important. Uh, I thought that if my code was awesome, everything was awesome, and that, and that was about all there was to it. And then after sort of refactoring lots and lots of UIs, um, we seem to, my company now, we seem to end up with really gnarly CSS and, and cleaning it up. And so we've done that at a bunch of different places. Um, Facebook, Salesforce, Adobe, PayPal. Um, we work with a lot of big companies to do some really cool UI refactors. Um, and over time, I guess I realized that um, an important part of it was actually the process that we were going through and the human issues that we were solving at the same time and how that related to the code issues that we were seeing. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that today. Um, and I'm going to also talk about how some of the ways that we use SAS and handlebars and some other tools um, to make the process a little bit smoother. Um, about six months ago, I hired a couple of just so amazing developers. I'm really, really happy to work with them. Um, and we just started fixing things. So whatever was the biggest pain point at that, at that moment, we'd fix it. Um, and then whatever was the biggest pain point, once that pain point was gone, we'd fix that too. And we've been sort of iterating on our process and we're far from uh, having it perfected. I think there's, oh, maybe we'll always be working on it, but um, we've come up with some ways of using SAS and some other tools that do seem to actually be working for us. Um, so this is an old school kind of um, style guide um, from 2007, I believe. Um, so this is the, the sort of um, version of a style guide that I want us to move away from. This is the like PDF tome that gets sort of delivered and worked on over and over and says, do do this and don't do that. Um, It'll have things like exactly the positioning and the sizes of the logo and the space between the letters of the logo and the, and the um, actual little triangle thingy, which sounds like a good idea, but in the web, this is usually a foregone conclusion. This is usually already something that's decided there's an asset for the logo and you don't mess with it for the most part. Um, so it's not overly useful. Also not so useful for the web is how to put the logo on a hat, right? Um, this is beautiful, right? It's their color palette. So it's got the warm colors on the left and the cool colors on the right. It seems really pretty and I like to look at it, but it doesn't help me know if I'm allowed to use that bright yellow for type or if it's only meant for backgrounds or if it's only meant to be used in gradients. So it's a little bit too, uh, too vague for um, being something for developers to actually use. The same for typography. Um, this is more of like a work of art. You know, it, it's great to me that the thesis typeface is warm and intuitive, but as a developer, I don't care. I just need to know what type do I need to use, what are my choices, and how do I stay within the boundaries and respect the design that's already been put forth. Um, so why don't these style guides work? Um, for me, they don't work because they take months and months to produce. Uh, that's, that's huge. The web is constantly moving. Our projects are constantly moving. In six months, the styles are going to have changed from what they were now. So if it takes six months to produce a guide like this, it'll be out of date before anybody ever gets it. Um, the other thing is that they tend to be design-centric and kind of exclude engineering from the equation. Uh, they're not a great way to have, to have a partnership between engineering and design. Um, so I think that we need to kill that type of style guide and that sort of vision of what a style guide can be so that we can have a leaner and sort of more effective version emerge. Um, we believe in living style guides. And that's sort of a term we made up, so I'll tell you a little bit more about it. 
Um, a living style guide is a guide to the existing site styles. It's not some esoteric, don't we really wish our styles were kind of like this. It's a guide to what the styles really are on the actual site. Um, the other thing is that it lives in code. Uh, it has to live in code. You need to use the same code to generate the style guide that you use to generate those same components on your site. Because if you do that, the style guide never gets out of date, unless you have components that are getting out of date, and that tells you something about what's going on with the site. Um, and then again, collaboration tool for engineering and design teams to work together. It really matters that we have a space where we can talk about design decisions that isn't in the feature. Because in one feature, it might feel like the right thing to do to choose another shade of gray for your dividing line. But if you make decisions like that over and over and over again, you end up with a bunch of incoherent designs, and you end up with CSS or SAS that doesn't make any sense at all, and that's really hard to work with. Um, so a good style guide will lead to a better UI code, more informed design choices, and then a, as well a better performing site. Um, this is what we've seen over and over again, is that as we refactor UI and give a, a set of styles for developers to use to build new pages, the site starts to get cleaner little by little. Right? So often we have this sense that we're on this path where, uh, with time, the technical debt is piling up and piling up. But if we have a, a style guide in place and we have pieces, Legos of, of functionality that we can use uh, without having to reinvent more SAS or more CSS, um, then we can end up with um, being able to build features without having to add code. Um, so this project that I'm going to talk to you about was a collaboration with Trulia. Um, they called us. Uh, I think it was last year sometime, and asked us if we could help them do a, a retake on their UI. Um, they were starting to notice that um, they weren't able to release features as fast. They had some uh, inconsistencies, and they wanted some help uh, figuring out how to do it. Um, their team is so good. Um, I have to say, in most of the places that I end up working with, there's somebody that has been trying to do a style guide for a while, has even made a start on it, and even maybe has some of the components that they need. But they've never gotten the support or the time to actually make it a reality. It's hard to do internally. There are features, there are pressures, priorities change. This is something where you really have to dig in and like build a substantial portion of the components required to build out a UI. Because if you don't, then it's going to be really easy for people to say, oh, it, what I need is never available in this style guide. I'll just go back to uh, doing it the old way. Um, so yeah, people often try internally to, to make this work. And it truly, a few developers had been really, and designers as well, had been really interested in creating a style guide. And they, there had been a few internal attempts. Um, so they were super excited. Um, they were motivated as well to switch to SAS, which made it a really fun project. Um, and they had enough legacy and technical debt um, that it made the whole thing worthwhile from a performance perspective, as well as from a team uh, efficiency perspective. So this is, a, um, this is a, uh, an image that one of their um, engineering managers sent to me. His name is Lewis, um, and it says, I've got the blues. And the reason he sent this is because each one of those blue links is actually a subtly different color of blue. Um, color pick errors. You know, People didn't know, or they were making decisions in various contexts, and they're basically ending up with uh, the blues, if you will. And so this is part of what motivated them to really want to be a part of the project. Our typical flow works like this. And we've done it over and over again, and it seems to work pretty consistently. I'm not going to say every project we've done is a success, but the vast majority have been. So we break it down like this. First, we do a visual inventory, which is all about finding out where are we at now? What do we need to know? What do we need to analyze? What data do we need in order to make decisions? Once we have that information, we kind of rationalize the styles. So even though the site has 50 different shades of blue, we're not going to build all 50. We're going to help the designers to make some decisions about which they want and which they don't want. Um, though I think it helps that we're not particularly opinionated about their choices, as long as they choose you know, less numbers. They can choose whatever blue they like. Um, and then finally, we build out an actual component library based on all of those choices. And so they get a substantial portion of code which actually fits with their new code standards, which actually uh, doesn't have the kind of duplication. And it kind of switches the, um, the momentum, I guess, of, of the project and of the, the code that they're working on over to something that's going to be more efficient. 
The final step is deployment, and that's something that the, the team actually participates in uh, pretty heavily. And we'll talk about that as well, which is, you know, once you have a component library, do you just like release it to your entire site at once, or how do you manage rolling that out? So like I said, the visual inventory is about finding the right data to make the decisions that you need to make in order to refactor the UI well. Um, a funny thing happened, actually. I was talking about, uh, about learning how to use SaaS and, and my sort of misadventures into using SaaS um, at Airbnb last year. And uh, a guy came up to me after the, the talk and he said, when are you going to do a talk about switching back to CSS from SAS when your SAS gets messy? <laughs> and I was like, what? I, th I mean, I kind of didn't understand where he was coming from with that. And so I said to him, well, when you were switching to SAS, you cleaned up your CSS, right? Like you, you actually refactored it. And he said, well, we didn't exactly have time to refactor it, so we just converted it and started writing SAS. And I was like, and you're shocked that that didn't turn out well. Um, you know, not having architecture, it actually doesn't matter what language you choose. You can screw up any language, right? So um, SAS, CSS, it's all, it, it's all basically equivalent if you don't think about, you know, how to structure your, your site and how to make it work well long term. Um, so the visual inventory is all about getting data about the ways that we haven't been having things work well. Um, how do we know what's going wrong? How do we even know what components we'd build or add to a style guide if we don't know where we're at now? So what Trulia did was choose 10 pages to analyze, and this is sort of a typical number. Um, or maybe they chose 12, I'm not sure. Um, but around that number, you don't want to have to look at your entire site. It would take too long, and the added value would be relatively small. Um, so we don't, we don't choose to look at an entire site. We choose sort of the most important pages. It could be for business reasons. It could be because they get the most page views. It could be because they're the oldest, or because the performance of those pages is um, the worst, and they want to make a big, a big change. I sort of advocate for page views in that, because um, you get more sort of user experience change um, by focusing on page views. Um, so what we want to find is that imagine you needed a rubber ducky component on your website. We want to find that you have a rubber ducky component. But much more frequently, this is what we find when we look into the styles. Um, styles duplicated over and over and over again. This is actually a really strong positive, because you can straight away see what's missing by what's being duplicated. Um, if you don't have a grid solution, you're going to have a zillion floats, right? If you don't have site-wide topography, you're going to have a bunch of font sizes. Um, so duplication is actually a fantastic way of seeing what abstractions are actually missing. Uh, we also have this kind of problem. All of these are rubber duckies, right? They're you know, various different kinds of rubber duckies. But they're also subtly different, right? And this is more the design side. This is the lots of shades of blue, uh, where we have you know, rubber ducky number two and four actually look exactly the same, except one has a scarf and, mit and one has mittens. Uh, this is what we have on a, on a website level all the time, uh, where we have uh, very subtle variations, where if you saw them right next to each other, you wouldn't necessarily want them to live on the same site. Um, so what do we need to know? We're basically trying to figure out two things. What are the missing abstractions? And what are the fundamental building blocks of the site? Um, finding all the variations. Um, so you might think that we'd go looking for just the button that we want to move on and have be the, the button going forward. But we're actually going to look for all the different buttons um, so that we can see them all next to each other. Um, so analyzing duplication. There are a few different ways that you can do this. Um, Grep will work. CSS Lint has, uh, has some options for that. And so does a new tool called CSS CSS, which is a Ruby gem, uh, which will let you analyze uh, what kind of property value pair duplication you have in your CSS. Um, on this project, we use Grep. It's not perfect. It's not going to be exact. Um, but we really need more orders of magnitude than we need uh, an exact value for anything. 
Um, so we're going to grep for different selectors, uh, properties, and values, and we're going to include all the CSS, the most crufty stuff, the bits that no one wants to touch anymore because that feature was released by Joe and he hasn't worked here for two years and nobody knows how he did his voodoo magic, but no one wants to break it. You want to include that too because you're going to find a lot of really interesting data from the, the crufty outer edges. Um, so if you're, how many people are comfortable in grep? Actually. Okay, that's not everybody, so I'm going to do just a little bit of grep stuff. Um, how many people are comfortable in SAS? Okay, lots, but still not everybody. Okay, awesome. Well, we'll do like a little quick grep primer. Um, so basically, we want to grep uh, um, font size, and we want to do minus R so that it's recursive, look in the current directory, and then we're piping the results to word count uh, minus L, which gives us the lines. Um, now, you're going to have to structure your CSS uh, in a particular way where you have one rule per, um, per line in order to get this to work well, but it is a quick way of being able to get results. Um, you can also put a regex in there, so you can do uh, h1 to h6, and that'll give you, um, you know, that'll give you your values for all of the different heading sizes. Um, so Trulia is amazing. They are a great development team. Um, we had a really good time working with them, and uh, even more amazing, they were willing to let me share some of their data with you so that we could all learn from it. Um, these are some of the grep results that I got when looking at their, at their um, data. Now, before you smile too much, go grep your own CSS. I think you'll be surprised. These are very typical. Um, this isn't like shockingly high for me. This is like on the level of most sites that have three, four, five years uh, out there on the web are going to be at this level. Um, it's also kind of indicative that it's the moment where something has to be done about it. Um, it's not like urgent, the house is not on fire, but like also it's starting to get difficult to release features, that kind of thing. So you'll see H1 to H6 is 564 instances of it, right? Now you know they're not using 564 different font sizes and things like that, right? So there's no point in having that kind of, uh, that kind of duplication. You'll see font size is even higher, 2,267. That often happens as people don't necessarily know about semantics and they aren't using real headings um, and they end up using classes or just making divs bigger, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's also pretty typical to have your font size be higher than your, your H1s to H6. Um, margins and paddings, being in the three to 4,000 range, very, very typical. Um, also way too high. Um, what does that mean if you have a ton of margin and padding declarations? Typically, it means that you're building things in a rigid way. So you're building your, your box or whatever it is to be exactly 567 pixels wide, and then you're trying to force it to look right and to line up with all of its neighbors um, by adding little padding and margin tweaks. Um, basically, uh, this is one of the biggest indicators to me that people need standard uh, spacing classes. But it's also um, an indicator that the design needs more flexibility and that the, develop, uh, that the code needs more flexibility, uh, that we need to take widths off of things and let them naturally fill the space that they, that they can fill. Um, the other ones below are padding zero and margin zero. And those are both in the like thousand range, right? That's resets, right? So if we had a proper reset on this site or, a, or a normalize, then that would take care of that and people wouldn't have to keep uh, setting that over and over again. Um, so when we saw this, we were excited because, um, and they were excited too, maybe a little chagrined, but they were excited because there's a lot of room for improvement here. Um, another slide with more data, um, at impor uh, sorry, pound important was at 495. That scared me when I saw it. That to me is people are having a really hard time getting their, their styles to look the way they're meant to look, and they're having to go to great lengths. They're basically having to um, start using a pound important because they don't have uh, selectors, which makes sense. Um, color, again, was 3,920. That, to me, was really high, and it said to me that they needed standardized colors. You could also see it looking at the site with the various shades of blue, um, but still, I wouldn't have quite expected it to be in the 4,000 range. Um, there were 6,000 hex values. White, so here I put just lowercase sfff, but that actually includes, like, 
uppercase, lowercase, all the combinations. Um, and that was about 1,200, right? So, I mean, granted, it's not going to be 10, but it doesn't need to be 1,200 either. Um, the total rules was around 16,000. Uh, that's, you know, that's pretty high. So we definitely felt like we could fix that. Um, and then background was declared 4,888 times. That's worrisome because backgrounds are often pulling in images, especially if you have a site that hasn't been moved to pure CSS3 yet. Um, you're going to have a site that's pulling in all kinds of different background images. Um, that's really going to slow down your performance. And the more places that you're doing it, the less likely it is that your attempts to fix it incrementally are actually going to have an impact. Um, and then unused CSS uh, was 186 KB, or 74%. Uh, that was just on the home page. I didn't test all the other pages. Um, Another place where we got good data um, was by looking at different display properties that are related to layout, right? So all of these properties like float and right and position and width are all about like I have a thing and I'm trying to make it be here with relation to its near neighbors. Um, these are all super high, you know, all above 1,000, some almost 5,000. This means that they absolutely need a template system and they need a grid system so that you don't have uh, sort of a reinventing the wheel on every uh, brand new thing. Um, the other thing is if you have a system where you um, have to uh, where you have to figure out how someone did layout every time you touch a feature, then you don't have a team that can easily slide from project to project and actually be effective. Because if you didn't work on the whatever button on the whatever page, it may lay out completely differently than the rest of the site does. It also meant they had a lot of little layout bugs. Um, so the other thing we want to talk about is design and consistency. And this is when our rubber duckies are almost the same, but not quite. Um, so this is the blues, having a bunch of different blue colors. Um, but it also happens uh, with other kinds of things, other kinds of components. So uh, we found that we wanted to build a tool that would allow us to, oops, sorry, you guys can't see this, can you? Give me just one sec. Um, we used to check all these things by hand. Um, and then more and more we found like that was really time consuming and kind of painful. Um, and so we've been going through and making it possible to automate the checking of different kinds of duplication and different kinds of components. Um, so I'm loading up the Trulia page and our topography browser extension um, and clicking persist so that I can get uh, the results across a bunch of different pages. And then I do generate report. And what we're going to get is a count in the left-hand column. Sorry, I know it's really blurry, but I'll talk you through what I, what's actually up there. Um, so the left-hand column is a count. So it shows the number of times that a node used that particular style. And then we have all the different information, like the RGB value and the font weight. And um, then we have sample text. Uh, the sample text really helps because later people will be like, wow, I don't know, what, you know where are we using uh, you know, 16 pixel, 700 weight font? And you can say, oh, it's the words for sale. And that helps to be able to find context. And then we can go ahead and um, you know, do a search for an apartment in New York with one bedroom and three baths. And um, when we go there, we can. Um, generate the report again, and do it again for another several pages. And we get really good data out. So you can start to see um, certain um, font sizes will be used in the hundreds of, of times, whereas others are used just four or one time. Um, the reason why this is interesting is because designers have to make a ton of decisions. And they don't always know all of the context of those decisions when they're trying to make them. And it can be really hard, actually, to um, it can be hard to make those decisions in the absence of data, right? Like stuff where you know, in the development world, we would never try to make a decision about performance without actually measuring. Well, I guess people do sometimes, but um, ideally, you would you would have data about what you know how your performance is impacted by different features if you're going to make a decision about performance. Um, but often in the in the design world, they have to sort of make decisions in a vacuum, and it and it can be quite difficult to do. 
Um, so if I can show them something like this where, um, let's see, one of the 12 pixel 400 weight open sans uh, font was used 206 times. And all the nearby neighbors were used something like 20 or four times. Then it makes it really easy for them to make a decision and say, oh, we're going to pick that. That's clearly our base font, right? That's, that's what we're using everywhere. Um, the one case where we have to be a little bit careful is that it will uh, weight itself toward the lower font levels because you're just not going to find as many giant headings on a page as you will normal paragraph text. Um, but this is the typical kind of thing that we'll find where on the left-hand side we have all the different font sizes, and in the center we have a count, and on the right-hand side we have whether they wanted to build it or not. Um, and you'll see that there's a lump in the middle there where they have their, their most used font sizes. And that's, uh, that's exactly how we decide what to build and what not to build. Uh, provide basically the, the designers at Trulia this data. And once they had the data, they were very willing to eliminate um, uh, unnecessary duplication. Um, the same thing goes for colors. So we'll go and we'll count all the colors used and then give, uh, give a count and help them decide. So in this case, um, they have one of the blues was used 1,305 times, and all the others were like 6 or 15 or 2. So whereas there could have been like a 30-minute design meeting where everybody said, I don't know which one really is our favorite blue and, and this kind of thing, I could say, well, based on the data, you really, really like this one blue, and this, these other ones look more like color pick errors or like, you know, one-offs or something that were, were unintentional. Um, and the end result of that is basically having a, a full stack with all the different topography that you need. We do it for other kinds of components as well. So we're going to do that for buttons. Um, we go and we, across all the pages that we've been given, we go and find every single button on the page. No matter how crufty or old or no matter how much somebody says, oh, that one, we're not using that anymore, we find them all and we put them all in one place. Um, there's nothing like showing design a whole bunch of variations that they've chosen to help them decide that it's time to actually pick uh, just a few ways of expressing buttons or really any component. Um, same with dividers. So these are going to be a little bit hard to see because they're all gray one pixel dividers. Like every site in the known universe has them. But how many shades of gray does one need, right? Um, so in this case, it's, it's usually people aren't even trying to choose extra stuff. It's not like they think that like CCC is going to be better than D2D2. Um, it's just that you know, they don't know what was chosen on other places in other parts of the site. They don't know what is the most used uh, color gray. Um, so we do this for all the different component types, and we find uh, as many variations as we possibly can. Um, when we're done with that, the next step is to do a state of the performance uh, talk at the company. Now, this is a presentation to basically present our findings. Um, and the goals are basically to help people understand the cumulative effect of a million tiny choices. I mean, I think you can imagine for a moment if I came in and I said, OK, we've been looking at your CSS and we found that you've declared margin 3,900 times, you'd have a moment of, oh, I think I might be doing something that isn't actually working, right? So a little bit of trying to shock people into getting engaged in the process is, is part of why we do this presentation. Um, so if you try to do something like this internally, it may make sense to actually show all your findings to, um, you know, to the team, to present it to both the designers and to the developers, because it really comes from both sides. Um, now, some places that I've worked, the design will be like, yeah, that's the developers duplicating stuff. And developers will be like, yeah, that's design who can't make a decision about what they want. Um, it's actually both, and it comes from both sides. And so part of, the, uh, part of the goal of presenting this picture that shows that it comes from both design and from, and from the development side is to say, come on, let's, let's actually fix it. The other thing is to help the broader team sort of understand why to bother with this effort. Um, you have a ton of choices about what to spend your time on, right? You could release a new feature, you could refactor the JavaScript, you could do any number of things. So why, why choose this one? Um, so, you know, if the data doesn't show it, if you just have duplication in like the hundreds, it's probably not the thing to do. Uh, but if you have duplication getting into the, like four or five hundred, then, you know, it is a refactor is probably in order. So when we're done with that, the next step is to do the rationalized styles step. 
This is about getting all the designers in a room and basically getting them to make some decisions. Which orange button is the orange button that they want? That kind of thing. Um, so for each component, they have three options. I tell them they can choose to build it, in which case we will uh, we'll build that in the next phase. They can choose to replace it. And in that case, they have to choose which component they actually want to build that they'd like to replace it with. That gives engineering a good guide for later that they can actually refer to, where they can say, OK, I don't have to ask the designer every single question. How should this be? How should that be? I can go and say, OK, all these orange buttons actually got replaced with this one orange button. So I'll go ahead and build this page with the orange button that was sort of blessed and chosen, and then go see the designer and say, did this work? Is this you know, more or less how you wanted it to be? And what can I tweak to make it a little bit better? There's a third option up here, which is redesign. But I really try to get people not to choose this option. It can be really tempting to say, oh, we don't really like any of our orange buttons. Um, but it's going to be really slow. Redesign takes time. There's lots of people that need to think about it. It's usually better to choose one of the things that exists already and then iterate on that. Um, so getting people involved early really helps with that. Um, people feel like they're part of the process. They're going to actually want to make the code better. The other thing that I try to do is to lower the importance of decisions. So people will be like, oh my god, we have to choose the one button that's going to be our button for the rest of time. And I'll say, or you choose the button that you want now, and whenever you want it to be a different button, we'll change it to a different style. Um, and that's a lot easier for people to actually work with and pick. I think sometimes, and, and uh, Angus's talk today sort of made me think about this, sometimes we think like our decisions are like final, final, final. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've not seen a final decision on the web yet. I think that's sort of not how it works. Um, so if we can lower the importance of our decisions and really think, ah, I choose this now, choose something else later, it makes it a lot easier to sort of centralize on at least choosing just one thing. Um, yeah, so decide on one thing. So if you have orange buttons, I really push hard to get them to pick one orange button. Don't care what it looks like. Don't care if they change it later. But really don't want to have six different kinds of orange button. And yes, we try to match the current styles unless there's a clear replacement. So this is part of the not redesigning unless you, you absolutely have to. Um, it's perfectly fine to make a style guide, which is like a guide to your existing styles rather than a guide to uh, what you would love your styles to be at some point. Um, so what's the result of this step? Like, what, you know, what do we get out of it? Um, the, the thing that I think is most important is we get a clear list of components which need to be built. Um, basically, uh, it's a list of bugs. Um, from every choice that they make, we open a bug in GitHub um, that's going to allow us to go ahead and start building out that component. Um, so it would look something like this. Uh, we would have uh, the different components that we're going to build as uh, actual GitHub issues. And then each one that's actually a component, rather than like a bug or whatever, we, we mark with component. And then we give it another tag, which just tells us what kind of component it is. That way, you can quickly grab all things related to topography or all the boxes or anything like that. Um, and then within any one of our issues, we actually show you know, what are the buttons that are chosen. Um, now, I think these are pretty close to the buttons that Trulia originally chose for us to build. So you'll see that uh, when I show you their, their eventual style guide, it actually didn't turn out like this at all. Um, so it's perfectly OK to iterate, to make a first pass choice, and then later say, well, you know what? We're going to change up these skins and make them look a little bit different. Um, the other thing is that at the bottom, we kind of detail the, the things that this button needs to be able to do. Uh, it needs to be able to go full width and fill its container if we want it to. Um, we need to have three sizes, so a large, a medium, and a small button. Um, and those things should be able to apply to any of the different colors without actually needing to write any more code. Uh, so this is sort of where we'd say, how is our thing going to be flexible? Um, so we've gotten to the phase where we're ready to build stuff. Um, it actually takes a little bit of time and working with, with a company before we get to this point where we, can, um, where we can say, all right, it's actually time to build components. Um, and it's always kind of exciting to get to, get to that point. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we use SAS to make things work. So I'm going to back up a step and just give a little bit of background on SAS so that anybody who doesn't uh, already work with it will know a little bit about what it can do. 
Um, I should say, too, I have loved switching to SaaS. I was sort of a, a bit of a holdout and um, didn't quite know whether, well, to be fair, most of the CSS preprocessors started by people who just wanted to change syntax stuff, like didn't like curly braces and wanted meaningful white space. And for me, I'm not that into stuff that just changes syntax. I want features, right? Uh, but most of the uh, preprocessors quickly moved into like adding features and adding value to what you can do with CSS. Uh, so I'm super excited about that now. Um, so the main features of SAS that I'm going to talk about today are variables, nesting, mix-ins, and inheritance. This is from the, the docs on the SAS uh, website, so you can go ahead and look that up and try it and play with it. Um, basically, what you'll see is you can define variables like up at the top dollar blue and, and dollar margin. And then you can refer to them down in your, uh, in your SCSS um, below, and those will resolve to uh, whatever the value is of that, of that color or that um, numeric value. Um, you'll notice as well that you can do operations on them. So the padding is actually the margin divided by two. And weirdly, the margin is also the margin divided by two. Not sure why that would be. Um, I will say that I don't actually agree with uh, having variables like dollar $blue, um, but we'll get a little bit more into that um, a few slides away. Um, so this is showing off nesting. Basically, instead of having your, um, your selectors each contain each level of the nesting, you can, you can put them inside of each other. Um, and that will resolve to normal CSS selectors uh, that show each of the levels. There are also mix-ins. So you can define mix-ins uh, and give them a name. Like in this case, we have a mix-in clear fix. And we've said that it, you know, it has zoom and before and after. It has the content of, uh, and display table. And then when you want to call that, you just put in your uh, actual um, element uh, at include and the name of your, of your mixin. And that will automatically copy your property value pairs. Um, you can also do selector inheritance. So uh, one of the things that allows us to efficiently create a lot of different buttons and to be able to say, like, come up with whatever button you want, iterate whenever you want, is because we have a base button style that gives us all the like heavy lifting of buttons, you know, makes them work cross-browser, makes the padding the same on IE, does all those annoying little things that you have to fix every time you have a button. And then the skins are really, really tiny. And we do that um, by actually... Um, creating um, a base class a button, and then we extend it um, in our specific types of buttons, like our primary and our secondary button. Um, so the first thing that I tried when I got into SAS was nesting. And it's where I got probably in the most trouble, so I'll share that with you a little bit. Um, it seemed super simple, and, uh, and yet I managed to screw it up. Um, so in normal CSS, you'd have basically like this. Imagine you wanted to give a clear fix to your box head, your box body, and your box foot. You might do it something like that, um, putting each of the selectors in there. Um, you do repeat a few things. You're repeating box a couple times. Um, and in SAS, you don't have to do that. So you can just have your wrapper box, and inside that you have box head, box body, and box foot, and you call your clear fix. Um, it all sounds simple and, and innocuous, but it's not as much so as it seems. Um, so what do we notice? Um, for me, it was super tempting to make the SAS match the HTML nesting exactly. And I will show you an example of how I went astray there. Um, all your selectors are scoped to the wrapper class. That's a really good thing. You know that you're not going to be sort of bleeding selectors out uh, here and there. Um, it's less typing the same thing over and over, and you can sort of approximate specificity as long as you're only using classes um, based on nesting. Um, so let's get to something practical. Let's imagine we were going to make a gray rounded corner box. Um, this is like the very typical gray box that exists on almost every single site out there, right? Um, so here we have our base uh, stuff, the same thing we were looking at before, where we have um, box head, box body, and box foot. And each one of them includes the, the um, micro clear fix. Um, don't worry too much about that for now. We'll get into includes a little more in a second. Um, so then imagine we said, great, so that was our base box, but now we want to make the gray one pixel rounded corner box. Um, we're going to go ahead and extend box. That way we know like it's covering all the clear fix stuff. We don't have to think about IE. Anything, anything that needed to be solved in a, in a basic box has already been solved. And we can just focus in, um, in box simple on the decorative stuff. 
Um, so this seemed really good. I felt like I was doing pretty well when I got to this point. Um, and so it made me a little bit curious. I thought, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to check out the output of what I'm doing. Um, and so I thought that it outputted this. So we've got all my box heads and bodies and foots, and then we've got the zoom one. And then it outputted this, and it has the content and the table. And then it also outputted that where it had the clear both. And I was like, wow, that is a lot more code than I ever would have written by hand, right? If, if that would just not happen if I was writing it by hand. Um, and so I found that I had to pay really close attention to the output of my SAS. Um, so the next thing I tried to do is make tabs. Um, in the OOCSS world, tabs are just a fancy kind of box. So they extend box. Um, that way they get all the clear fixing and, and yummy goodness that comes along with boxness. Um, so here, basically, I'm telling SAS um, that tabs extend box. Super simple. I'm kind of skipping the styles related to tabs specifically. Um, but this is sort of where all hell broke loose. Um, I kind of went crazy. Uh, nesting felt so good. It felt like really the right thing to do. I thought, oh my goodness, this, this is just awesome. My, my SAS is matching my HTML almost exactly. Um, and it's ridiculous. I'm the queen of teeny tiny selectors. I'm the queen of itty bitty CSS. And this felt so good. Um, unfortunately, then I looked at the output and realized it was not good. Um, these were the kind of selectors I was creating. These are horrible. They're way over-specified, right? We don't need selectors like that. We know that the um, A inside of a tab head, inside of a box head and tabs is, is uh, the only thing that can possibly be in there is a tab uh, link, right? It's not going to be some other random link floating around in there. So there was no need to have all these multiple uh, levels of control. Oh, the other thing that I want you to notice, um, in case you're new to SAS, is that you can get it to output the line numbers of where in your SAS files different pieces are coming from. This can be really good, specifically if you end up uh, inheriting and also um, including all kinds of different things from different places. Sometimes the order doesn't end up being exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, so if I'd been writing CSS, I would have absolutely known to sp skip these unnecessarily uh, levels of complication. But in the SAS world, it felt really, really good. Um, somehow I became kind of disconnected from the output. And um, that was something that we had to, we had to sort of, I, I would say on the Trulia project, we went nuts with SAS. We were like trying all of the SAS things. And then we said, oh wait, some of these are actually not working out the way that we'd hoped them to. And so we pulled back and found like a, a more uh, nice balance. Um, I know people have been showing slides like this already, but our taste for more just seems to grow. Um, this is our uh, CSS transfer size and CSS requests over time. Requests are pretty good. They're kind of stable, but we just keep sending more CSS over the wire. And pretty much any time I go and look at this, uh, it's from uh, HTTP archive, uh, pretty much any time you go and look at it, it's going to look like that. We're just pushing more and more and more over the wire. Um, so I think that we need to be thoughtful about uh, our SAS output uh, even when it isn't as fun as just writing things infinitely nesting. Um, so the SAS community came up with something that I think is pretty awesome. It's the inception rule. Um, the idea is that you never go more than three levels deep. Um, so if you're writing a selector and you're finding your nesting is getting more than three levels steep, you rein it back in and you think, do I really need this extra level or would it be enough to say uh, just two to three? Um, since we decided to work like that, I found that our, our output is uh, actually a lot better. Um, so what's happening under the hood? Uh, how is the SAS actually converting to CSS? Um, so I built the clear fix in order to see how mix-ins mix work. I wanted to you know, figure out exactly what was happening in the output. Um, so here's a mix-in for clear fix overflow. So it's got the, the overflow hidden clear fix hack. Um, and so my cool thing is including ClearFix Overflow. Um, basically, looking, looking at the output, I notice that all those property value pairs are being copied. Um, so when you're using mixins, you have to be aware of the number of property value pairs that you have more than anything else. 
Um, so I tend to use them when I wouldn't want the class in the HTML, something like clear fix or like, you know, border radius, whatever. This isn't something that you want to be kind of hanging out in your CSS and so, uh, oh, sorry, in your HTML because it doesn't really have meaning. Um, so those are cases where I really actually like to use a mix in. And I tend to try to use them for things that have small numbers of property value pairs. Um, you especially have to be careful when you've included a mix-in that has subnodes, and then you extend that thing that included it, because you will end up with kind of crazy pants combinations of, of um, subnodes times uh, things that extend it. Um, so using add extends so that we know how that uh, changes things. Imagine we wanted to build these three message boxes. So you've got your error and your information and your alert and all that stuff. Um, we could go ahead and define message at the top. And so that's going to have, you know, all the basic stuff that one of these boxes has. So it's got a border and it's got a background color. Um, and it's including our border radius uh, as well. Um, then in error, info, and, and success, we just extend dot message and we don't have to say all of that stuff about them. Um, so what is extend output in the CSS? Uh, the values are actually going to be comma separated. So at the top we'll see, uh, in line 1279, we'll see dot message, dot error, dot info, dot success, and then we see all the uh, property value pairs associated. Uh, what's really great is that, I mean, obviously you don't want to use a border radius um, um, vendor prefix stuff anymore, but if you used one that, that, um, that outputs to something much larger, it's actually really useful if you've used extend because you aren't actually duplicating that stuff over and over again the way you would with include. Um, so extends is going to avoid the property value pair duplication, but it's going to cause selector duplication. Um, it's really going to work a lot better with simple selectors. If you're finding yourself with very uh, complex multi-level things, it might be worth it to just not extend it and have a little bit of duplication and have your, your SAS be not quite dry. Um, it can also be really messy with nested subnodes, um, tabs or something like that where you have uh, lots of different subnodes. Um, and messy output when um, many classes extend another class. Uh, that's just something that's better to avoid altogether. Um, so what I found was that in SAS 2, uh, what we want is to, if we need a rubber ducky, have a single rubber ducky. Uh, but what we end up with is often uh, lots and lots of rubber duckies. Um, so it turns out that, you know, you can choose your, your poison. Um, you can make a mess with CSS. You can make a mess with SAS. Uh, the architecture, actually, I've found is pretty similar for the two. Uh, one just gives you more tools. Um, um, so sometimes, actually, we actually back up to the OOCSS way of extending things, which is we add another class on our, on our um, actual element in the HTML. It can be simpler. Um, it depends. You know, if it's a very small thing, very small number of property value pairs, no subnodes, things like that, we'll go ahead and do it another way. Um, but if uh, it seems like it's going to make a gnarly mess like my box stuff did, we'll go ahead and actually just put the two classes in the HTML. Um, so how do we use SAS and also have good architecture? Because I showed you a bunch of stuff about uh, how to seriously mess it up, right? All the things that I did, because uh, I like to try everything the wrong way first. Um, so what are some of the things we can do to make it turn out right? Um, the first thing I noticed is to build simple components first. Um, they often get used in the more complex components. So if you build all your topography stuff, um, then when you build your tabs, you won't have to specify topography stuff. It should just automatically work. Um, we also do variables. We do uh, multiple levels of variables. So remember when I told you that I don't actually like variables that include color names? Um, so that was sort of true and sort of not. I don't like to use those throughout my SAS files because you can't know how those should be used. But I do actually like to have a layer of them in my variables file. Um, so the first thing that we created was, um, was variables. And so we'll have something like light gray and pale gray. Well, <laughs> it's funny, pale gray. Um, anyway, gray and dark gray. And we'll have our oranges and dark oranges and things like that all defined there. Uh, but we don't actually use those uh, in the, um, the resulting SAS file. Files. We're going to use it more like this. In a subsection of the variables file, we're going to have sort of a configuration area for a particular component. 
Um, so we might have all of our links, and we might have our different link colors, and our link hover color, and our uh, low light link color, and things like that. The reason I like variables like that more is because I can change that later, right? I know exactly what's going to be affected by that. I'm not going to affect all the things that were ever green on the entire site. I'm just going to affect the, the uh, link hover color. Um, so having your variables uh, layered in this way means that you can quickly see what that actually refers to without having to remember hex values, right? You know that that's going to be your green, your standard green, and you're not going to end up with a proliferation of different greens. Uh, but at the same time, you can change it later without worrying about what will happen with it. Um, the next thing I'd suggest making is your topography stuff. Um, so you want to have all your topography things sort of sorted out beforehand. And it's going to look pretty simple like this. Um, where you have uh, you know, basic stuff that you'd be defining everywhere. SAS doesn't have to look like SAS necessarily. It should just add on that little extra something that you need in order to get the job done more smoothly. So in this case, it looks just like CSS, except that we have an include for font size. That allows us to output rems without having to um, know how the rems work. Uh, you know, figure out the actual rem value. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to actually be doing that, and I don't want to mess it up for sure when I'm, when I'm making something. So having a little um, include that allows us to um, get from pixels to, to the actual rem value works well for us. Um, so we have a function like this where we have, and, and these would generally speaking be in our utilities. So we're going to have something like this where we can calculate our rem value and we'll have a font size um, mix-in that allows us to uh, output both the pixel-based fallback and the, the rem value. Um, and going on with topography, we're actually going to have uh, different type colors as well. So we have uh, a base type color and low light type color and, and all the different things that we'd want to be able to configure. Uh, what our designers found, uh, the Trulia designers found, is that um, they were wanting to make changes almost as soon as the library and the style guide was done. And they found that a lot of the initial changes they wanted to make, they could actually make through this variables file. It's sort of like a, a config for your, for your style guide. Uh, and that meant that they didn't have to dig into the guts of the components straight away and see how they were working. Give me just a second. Um, I want to talk a little bit about deployment um, because it actually matters. Once you have a style guide available to you, you have to figure out how to actually get it live on the site and structure the rollout. Um, so generally speaking, you want to choose something like your most trafficked pages, your most important flows, and uh, you want to go for something like 80% of your page views, because then you're actually making a big impact, even though you may not have touched every single crufty page of your entire site or every single view of your app. Um, and then you can convert other pages just as new features are added. Um, and for new features, uh, you want to add new functionality to the library first. I mean, Honestly, it's really hard when you're you know, trying to get a feature out to do that, but it is something that uh, keeps the library up to date a little bit better. Um, so Trulia chose to actually convert their SRP, which is their search results page, um, mainly because it was already on the agenda for a redesign, which made it an easy target. Sometimes um, you, know, you can want to do like, the most important page, but it makes sense to do the thing that anybody, everybody, anyway, everyone was going to do uh, soon. Um, really important is to figure out what your real user measurement should be. Um, what matters to you? Uh, this is something where uh, it's going to be individual to every site. For Facebook, it's how closely your social network on Facebook matches your social network in real life. Uh, for other sites, there are going to be different things that actually matter to them. Uh, the thing is to take real user measurements and to uh, sort of res relentlessly try to make them as accurate as possible and to compare them to actual perf measurements. Um, so Trulia found that their new HTML after implementing a style guide and component library was about 48% smaller. Um, interesting since we ended up going with the multiple classes method in cases where the SAS output would have been too large. Um, they found they had a 21% faster load time um, and a 60% faster time to first byte. Now, I want you to realize that this is a combination of things. There are design changes. There are some back-end changes. There's a lot less code on that page. Um, so it's all kinds of people working together to make this happen. 
Um, they also were able to reduce their unused CSS by about 150 KB, uh, which is huge, right? And I think they're going to have room to actually make it smaller because they're still having to pull in like a header and footer that came from the old site. Um, their search results page, page views were up about 11%, right? That's huge, right? If you could promise a product manager a feature that would get them an 11% bump in page views, they would totally go for that, right? But often performance, unfortunately, gets a, a back seat. Um, their property detail page, which isn't the page that we converted at all, but does get a lot of traffic from, from the search results page, actually had a 3% bump in page views, even though no code on that actual page was changed. Um, so Trulia also has other metrics that they care about, including click-throughs, leads, uh, customer satisfaction, and also their filter use. Every single one of these metrics also improved. In fact, they've found a really strong correlation on their site between performance and how users behave and their, uh, their most important real user metrics. Um, so for me, the takeaway is that uh, this was clearly a group effort. You're going to have to get lots of people uh, involved if you want to do this on your own site. Um, it includes uh, UI layer improvements, server-side cleanup. This is like a, a huge team job. It's not, uh, not a one or two person thing. Um, SAS can also be made performant when it's effectively combined with object-oriented CSS for architecture. Um, you know, we were able to get a really good bump in the performance that we were pretty happy with. Um, I think most importantly, though, uh, the team is actually enjoying working on the site again. Uh, they were frustrated because there was so much technical debt that it was hard to get things done. And even when they did, they had a sense that they weren't quite doing it how they wanted to. Um, and so getting some of that out of the way has meant that they feel a little more ownership and are, and are, and are really having a good time with it. Um, the other takeaway that I would say is performance is a feature. Making the site faster will actually really matter to your users. It will make them click more. It will make them shop more. It will make them uh, do all of the things that you want them to do more. Um, so you know, if, if you do nothing else from this talk, go measure some stuff. Uh, measure what your users are doing so that you can figure out when you made a performance improvement if it actually did impact it so that you can get uh, your product managers uh, more interested in, in prioritizing performance. Okay. Thank you very much.